Welcome back for part two of Lifestar EMS's November 2020 monthly training. We have already covered communication safe practices, so this discussion is going to be on medication safe practices. You might be interested to learn that in 2019, according to our records, Lifestar EMS administered medications to patients 3,755 times. I would like to take a moment to point out that in 2019, we were not asking people very strongly to use the flow chart button in the patient care report. Here is the flow chart button and we go down to medications and you can see all the medications that you can chart that we gave our patients. In 2019, many people were still in the habit of only discussing medications given in the narrative. If you do it only in the narrative, we cannot do research which would allow us to figure out how many times medications were given. So this number of 3,755 is likely quite a bit lower than the real number. Of those medications given in 2019, here is a list of the top 10. It's in reverse order actually, so down here at the bottom, fentanyl is the most commonly given drug to patients by far, and then ondansetron, which is Zofran for nausea, albuterol, dilaudid, nitro spray, all the way down to Ativan. Just because these are the top 10 drugs, though, doesn't mean that we are not in the habit of giving a lot of very serious medications with a good amount of frequency. Here's an example of some of the medications that have very serious consequences if they're given incorrectly. And that is why we are very careful in the way in which we give medications and we do a lot of training on the topic. When you make a medication error, the consequences can be anything from no negative consequences at all to some mild symptoms that are easily recoverable to some pretty serious stuff. My daughter, Emily Christine Jerry, was born February 24th of 2004. She was playing in, in the backyard with her brother and sister, uh, Nate and Catherine. And uh, I noticed that every, every so often, um, Emily would stop and grab her side and, and wince. After witnessing this occur three or four times during the course of the afternoon. Neither one of us as parents really thought much of it, but we knew that we needed to take her in to have her checked out. We took Emily to a leading pediatric facility uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, they had decided to run Emily through uh, the MRI scanner. And there was a grapefruit-sized mass in, in Emily's abdomen. They prepared us to expect the worst. They set our expectations, you know, expect that, that your little girl is gonna lose a significant amount of weight during the course of treatment. She's gonna lose her beautiful blonde ringlets. She'd be vomiting, most likely, and, and things of that nature. She didn't start losing uh, those beautiful blonde ringlets of hair until January. Of, of 2006. But I, I, I knew in the back of my mind that quite possibly the tumor wasn't responding to uh, that, that course of treatment. So the decision was made to run Emily through the MRI scanner again. Emily's tumor had completely disappeared. There wasn't even any residual scar tissue remaining in her abdomen that they had anticipated. A miracle had occurred. And those are the caregiver's words, not mine. At this point, they recommended one final three-day round of chemotherapy, just to make sure that there wasn't any residual cancer cells remaining. I arrived about 
10 or 15 minutes after they had started Emily's IV that day. And uh, when I walked into Emily's treatment room, Emily was unconscious. I was thinking to myself, how could this have happened? I mean, she was just fine. What was found to have happened was the, the clinical pharmacy that day ran out of standard bags of saline with 0.9% sodium chloride. And so this young pharmacy technician decided to take an empty compounding bag and she saw three vials of what's called hypertonic saline, which is 23.4% in concentration. She filled this empty compounding bag with those three vials of hypertonic uh, saline and used that as the base solution for Emily's chemotherapy that day. She thought she was doing the right thing. That Wednesday was when my wife and I had to make the most difficult decision of our lives, which was after multiple EEGs showed little to no brain activity. The decision was made to take Emily off of life support. That day is still a blur to me emotionally. I was packing some of Emily's things from her treatment room into the back of our SUV, which happened to be parked on the top floor of the parking garage at the, the facility that day. And I saw the car seat in the back of that SUV and I was thinking, you know, maybe I should just take a fly and leap off this parking garage and go and join my little girl. I had never had those kind of thoughts or feelings before in my life. And it was almost at, the, at, at that moment that I decided to embark on this career. I, I don't want to say that it was chosen, that I chose it. I believe it was chosen for me. And uh, worked so passionately on, on, through my advocacy efforts to, to try to find or be an active part of the solution to preventable medical errors. And so in striving to be part of the solution, I've been working very hard through the programming of the Emily Jerry Foundation. I believe that we can get to zero deaths in the United States from preventable medical errors because they're just that, preventable. That story is absolutely heartbreaking to listen to, especially since it's coming from the mouth of the father of the child and it reminds us how high the stakes can be sometimes. There is a principle out there that says that true disasters require a whole series of mistakes to happen uh, before it becomes a disaster. It's not just one mistake. There are usually many mistakes that occur. And they talk about like the Titanic and other uh, major things like the Challenger explosion. These are things that many mistakes were made and that led to the disaster. In EMS, we are out there without these protective systems that help to prevent those mistakes. So we don't have like a, a we don't have a checkoff form or a sheet or a computer that's controlling the medications that we give. We are pulling the medication out of the box ourselves and drawing it up and deciding on the dose and giving it all by ourselves. And that removes many of the protective mechanisms that would require a series of mistakes to happen before you have a disaster. It's an important thing to think about because we talk about pre-hospital care and frequently the examples I use are in hospital care and we want to remember what the difference is between the two and how independently we're operating out there. Take this case for example. You're looking at a picture of Redonda Vought. Redonda was a nurse at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Tennessee and she was assigned in 2017 to bring a patient who they suspected of a subdural hematoma to get a CT scan. 
that was Charlene Murphy, a 75-year-old woman. And Charlene had a lot of anxiety about being put into a CT machine because it's such an enclosed, confined space. So the doctor gave an order for Versed. For those who don't know, Versed is a benzodiazepine sedative. So it would have made Charlene much more comfortable with the process, calm her down, and let her tolerate the CT scan. So Redonda goes to the Pixis machine. The Pixis machine is a computer-controlled dispenser of medications. You type in the patient name and the chart number, and it dispenses the medication that's been authorized and called for. And so she goes to the machine, and she looks for Versid, and she can't find it. That's because in the machine, it was programmed in under its generic name of midazolam. So not knowing what to do, she hit the override button, which nurses do quite a bit when they can't find a medication or they have to get something quickly. And she begins typing in Versed and she gets to VE and a drug pops up on the screen. And that drug is Vecaronium. For those who don't know, Vecaronium is a paralytic agent. It's something we use for RSI. It's to knock down the patient's gag reflex and render them paralyzed so you can intubate them without causing that gag reflex. Vecaronium works on all skeletal muscles, and so it also makes it so the patient can't breathe. So she gave Vecaronium instead of Versed to the patient, who was then put into the CT machine. Imagine this for a moment. You're already in anxiety over being put in this machine. You're very nervous. You're not happy about what's going on. You're 75 years old and helpless in this healthcare environment. And then you're given a medication which does not make you unconscious but makes you paralyzed and unable to breathe. And then you're put into this machine. That is the most terrifying thing I can imagine would happen to a patient that is already anxious about a CT scan. Now, the reality is that after not breathing for a short time relative to us, she was probably rendered unconscious and so wasn't suffering at that point. However, she was in respiratory arrest, not breathing, and then that was quickly followed by cardiovascular arrest, and they didn't notice it for a while. Finally, when they pull her out, uh, they find her to be in cardiac arrest. They did achieve ROSC, but then she died later of anoxic brain injury. This is one of my favorite internet personalities when it comes to EMS. He is Z-Dog. And I want you to listen to his position on Redonda and where he thinks the failures are. And then we'll come back and I'll talk about a couple other things. Hey, what's up, Z-Pack? It's your boy, Z-Dog MD, Dr. Zubin Amanya. Okay, check it out. This is a quick editorial that I really have to get off my chest. Uh, I'm not doing it live because I don't want to be distracted by comments. I just want to give you my thoughts on this case of the Vander Vanderbilt nurse who we've talked about before. Her name is Redonda Vaught, and the name was just released because she was arrested for reckless homicide and <clears throat> abuse of an impaired adult. Here was the story, and we did a show about this a while back, and then a follow-up show about just culture and how we can improve safety in the hospital and why we shouldn't you know, uh, focus on blame for mistakes, but we should focus on process improvement. So this, the basic story is this. Um, Nurse Vaught was taking care of Charlene Murphy, who was a 75-year-old woman who was admitted for a subdural uh, hematoma with some symptoms. She was getting better. Uh, presumably this was neuro ICU from what I hear and a lot, a ton of people have messaged me information on the backstory of this and <clears throat> privately. And, and so she was uh, a help all nurse that day, had a preceptee with her that was following her. Um, this was not her you know, usual patient and she had to go to radiology to take the patient down there for a full body scan. This was, she didn't even know where radiology was because the place, this particular place apparently wasn't on her normal beat. And we know this because of the CMS report, which I've uh, linked to on the website for the original video I did, which I'll put in the links. Okay, 
So she goes there, the patient's claustrophobic, she's ordered for Versed for uh, the claustrophobia and sedation in the scan. She goes to the Pixis, <clears throat> it's not in the Pixis, uh, it, it's not showing up on the orders in the Pixis, so she does an override, types in VE, a drug comes up, turns out it's Vecuronium. She doesn't go through the five rights of, you know, right patient, right drug, right, you know, right route, all of that. Uh, overrides, <clears throat> reconstitutes the Vecuronium, presumably, because you have to actually reconstitute it. And, and it's presumably Vecuronium actually says on there, paralytic agent. But this happens. She administers the drug. They put uh, um, uh, Miss Murphy in the scanner. And 30 minutes go by, she scanned. She's not monitored. They kind of can barely visualize her. They don't notice that she's not breathing. She comes out, they realize she's not breathing. They call a code. She suffers irreversible brain damage. The family ends up withdrawing support uh, in the unit. <clears throat> this was a tragedy on every level. It was an entirely preventable error. We've talked about already on the show why and how and who and what, and people have weighed in on, you know, this should never happen, you know, this was reckless or it wasn't reckless, it was a systems problem, whatever. The bottom line is she made a mistake and the patient died in a terrible way. Vanderbilt then told the patient ultimately that this was a medication error, never told them what medication it was according to the family. They found out a year later, CMS does an investigation, didn't think that Vanderbilt was actually improving processes around this and threatened to withhold Medicare funding at which point Vanderbilt did some uh, uh, changes that, that weren't public, that they haven't made public. Now, here's where it gets really crazy. Yesterday, I think it was yesterday, <clears throat> she was arrested and indicted on these charges of reckless homicide and abuse of an impaired adult. Now, it's been a year. Now, people who know her have already uh, come forth to me and said, this is a nurse I've known for years. She's a great human being. She's a wonderful nurse. She was respected and liked. And she made a mistake that has devastated her. She's already gone through tons of therapy because of this. And there's a phenomenon called second victim effect where she is a victim as well of this terrible mistake and whether it should have happened or not, we talked about in the other show. But the bottom line is, is this a criminal act now? Is arresting her and putting her in prison and making her go through trial a good way to improve safety and hold people accountable in medicine in the future? Does the family want it? By the way, the answer to that is, it seems like not. They have gone on record and said that if Charlene um, Murphy were alive today, she would have forgiven this nurse and would have been so sad that there are now two victims and two lives destroyed and two families destroyed because of this. And there has been on the back end an outpouring of support for this nurse. Well, here is what I think. This is a shameful act to put this woman who is already paying the price for her mistake in prison. If you are gonna do that, you should put all of the administrators at Vanderbilt who are overseeing her, who are overseeing safety, who are responsible for communicating with CMS and with the patient, they should all go to jail. How is it that we throw our frontline healthcare providers under the bus? for a mistake that was partially contributed to by a system that allows a patient to be unmonitored in radiology, that allows a Pixis to dispense, you know, Vecuronium and be recovered. I mean, there's so many failures you can point to, including the human failure, right? From Nurse Vaught, the, including that. But how can, if you put this woman in jail, this is gonna set a precedent that is gonna destroy what little morale we have left on the front lines. Do you remember we did a show about Dr. Bawa Garber? In, she's a pedi she was a pediatric resident in Great Britain, was also arrested and charged criminally with you know, negligent homicide, manslaughter, whatever it was, because of a mistake she made where she missed sepsis on a child she was caring for in the hospital as a resident with a ton of other patients, a mistake any of us could have made, and she was arrested and criminally charged. And we talked about how inappropriate that was. Is this different? 
in a just culture environment, you would look at all the problems. Was there malice? Was there intent? No. Was there maybe reckless uh, uh, behavior in terms of missing uh, uh, you know, the, the five rights and all the ways you dis dispense medication and looking and monitoring and all that? Maybe. But does that mean that you go to jail for that? Who here hasn't made a mistake that's harmed a patient who takes care of patients all the time? I'm not raising my hand. I've made those mistakes. If I was afraid I was going to go to jail, what do you think will happen to reporting of errors from now on? They are going to be even more covered up than they already are. What we need is radical transparency. What we need is a system that helps to improve itself when we find errors like this and make sure they never happen again. We need accountability from our leadership, our leadership to make sure that systems improvement happen and that radical transparency occurs. I have heard from this nurse's friends that she was told she wasn't going to be fired. Then she was marched in like a month later and told, bye-bye, there's the therapist's office. Okay? And say what you will about whether she should have been fired or not. This is just terrible, terrible systems architecture and management. And until I learn more about how Vanderbilt is, is handling this, they have thrown this nurse under the bus until proven otherwise. Okay? That's my take. So here's what I say to Redonda Vaught, okay? I support you. I don't think you should be in prison. I think you have suffered enough. I think the people who are responsible for changing systems and architecture in that hospital need to be held accountable and need to improve the systems. I need you, ZPAC, to share this, to leave your comment. If you disagree with me, cool. Come at me in the comments, okay? I didn't do this live because I didn't want to go at you right now, but I'll go at you in the comments. Come at me. And I want Redonda to know that there's a good part of the ZPAC that really supports her in recovering. By the way, the Tennessee Board of Nursing did not rescind her license. They looked at the case. That's my understanding of it, okay? This is a civil case. If the family wanted to sue and all that, that's a different subject. This is not a criminal case. And if we start treating our frontline nurses and our frontline staff who are suffering all around the country as criminals, when patients are punching at them and everybody's pushing on them, you will break this system and we will not stand for it. That is it. So I hope you're with me on this. If you're not, leave a rational response why you think I'm wrong and why this woman should go to jail for a mistake. All right, guys, hit share and we out. You can see why I like this guy, right? Dr. Demania here, the Z-Dog, is uh, an ER physician, and he has podcasts and broadcasts, YouTube channel, uh, websites, all dedicated to talking about current issues in emergency medicine, both in and out of hospital. I highly recommend you look him up and watch some of his stuff. It's very educational, very good, and very inspirational. It makes you feel better about working in this, in this field. And it's also nice to know that somebody, at least spiritually, has your back. One of the things he was wrong about, however, was whether or not the Tennessee Department of Health is going to engage in disciplinary action against Redonda. And they recently changed their mind. So he, he recorded this before this decision was made. But they are, in fact, going after her license on top of the criminal prosecution and whatever civil liabilities may be uh, in store for her down the road. So when I say that patients aren't the only ones who pay the price, you also can ultimately pay some consequences for medication errors. I have spoken from time to time about pursuing liability insurance. I encourage you to look into that uh, topic as well. Uh, Dr. Demania, in his defense here of Redonda, talks about system failures. You remember I mentioned this idea that it takes a whole series of mistakes to lead to a disaster. And so he points to things like uh, there should have been a policy in place about observing patients that are in CT. The PIXIS system shouldn't allow overrides so easily, or if it allows overrides, you need to have a better control in place for that. Some kind of confirmation of the override, uh, perhaps better programming of the PIXIS system so that it has both the trade names and generic names in there to avoid those kind of mix-ups where she has an order for Versed 
and it's only stored under the name midazolam. Not every provider, perhaps, is aware of both names for every drug. You get used to calling a drug by one name, right? So these are all sorts of system breakdowns, and he says the whole system needs to be changed in order to protect her, and you can't have just one mistake uh, be the be-all and end-all of making your, up your mind on what should happen to this provider. So I ask you this question. What kind of systems are there in place to prevent you from making a similar mistake? The truth is, in EMS, we're out there all on our own. We don't have a Pixis in the ambulance, and there's no way that's going to happen. You can put the drugs in a lockbox, but all you have to do is unlock the box and pull the drug out. You still have to verify it's the right drug, right patient, all the rights uh, and verify that you're not making any mistakes on dosing medication or calculations. You can't rely on one person's note about what the right dosing is on a medication. You have to be sure of it yourself. If you download applications that calculate medication dosing, uh, that's terrific, except who wrote that program? And are you sure that the numbers that are getting spit out are correct? Have you verified, have you done on paper a calculation and then gone to the nifty application in your phone and compared what answers come out of there just to make sure that the software is giving you the right answer? You know, obviously, the people who write these things are trying to be accurate, but you don't know who's sitting in their basement of their mom's house writing these applications, right? So you really are out there on your own when it comes to doing things right. So what systems are in place to prevent you from making the same mistake? The only system we have in place is your training. And we practice medication math so frequently, and we talk about medication so frequently, and we require you to attend 75% of your monthly trainings in order to put the training and the muscle memory in place to help you make decisions better when you're out in that ambulance. Let's take a look at some of the best practices for IV push medications that are out there right now. Thank you, Mike, and good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you today, and uh, thank you all for attending. It's great to have this level of attendance. Uh, Susan and I are particularly pleased to have this opportunity. You know, as ISP nurses, Mike mentioned, it's great to have this audience and share with you ISMP's work around uh, addressing, uh, certainly identifying common unsafe practices and at-risk behaviors that are associated with IV push medication preparation and administration. And we think that this is particularly important work uh, because perhaps to a large degree, frontline nurses may not recognize the risks and perhaps as well, uh, nurse managers and nurse educators. So this morning, I'm going to lead off, as Mike mentioned, with some of these common safety concerns, and then Sue's going to follow up with a review of strategies from our ISMP uh, Safe Practice Guidelines for Adult IV Push. So hopefully good information for you today. So let me give you some context for this work. Uh, we looked at errors that are reported uh, to the ISMP uh, National Medication Errors Reporting Program. Uh, the observations that we gain when we're on site during proactive medication safety risk assessment are really valuable to us. We uh, typically have the opportunity to shadow practitioners in their work. So when we're on site and we're looking at medication preparation administration, we can be talking to frontline nurses about their way of practice and understand what may be behind some of the choices that they're making. 
Uh, we certainly have gotten a wealth of information from a number of surveys uh, that we have performed in um, the last number of years. Uh, in a 2010 survey, we actually were looking at what were some of the consequences of the economic crisis on medication safety, and there's some findings in there that were very useful to us. A couple years later, there was a survey that we were pushing out through the newsletter to get a sense of what nurses were doing and how they were measuring doses uh, from carpet jacks to take into account the overfill. And I'll share with you some of the probably uh, unique findings that, that we came to understand. Then in 2014, we had a fabulous response, almost 1,800 participants, uh, to a survey where we were trying to get a gauge on dilution practices, and we sure did uh, understand a lot of disparate and, and very risky practices uh, related to dilution. Uh, this summer, we sent out another newsletter. We were trying to get a sense at that point in time um, how things were evolving in the use of safe practices, particularly around dilution and also uh, recognizing the impact of the drug shortages. And of course, all of this was informed through uh, a peer-reviewed uh, literature search. Uh, and this is important work as well. I mean, IV injection, IV infusion is an important component of care. You think of patients in hospitals now, and the large majority are receiving some form of, of IV therapy. And it's because it's clinically advantageous. Uh, IV push medications can reach an immediate therapeutic effect and support plasma levels to reach an early target. But for much the same reason, we can get into trouble because the immediate bioavailability, uh, the narrow therapeutic margin of many of these medications, and also the limited ability to review, uh, reverse the systemic effects once administered IV. Um, certainly, we recognize that many high alert medications are given intravenously. And and you are probably all very familiar that our definition of a high alert medication are those that, when given an error, are much more likely to cause significant patient harm. So we recognize in the literature that we have a lot of reports about IV uh, medication errors. We know less about IV medication administration errors in terms of their incidence, their severity, and their proximate causes. But here's a study... Um, from the American Nurses Society, uh, American Nurses Association, sorry, looking at injectable medication administration. This is back in 07. They had a good response. There was about a thousand nurses and those respondents, actually 99% believed that the risk to patients was very serious if these medications were given in error. And about half of the nurses responding believed that they were going to likely have the error during the preparation and administration phase. And so we also recognize that despite its uh, ability, this method of giving IV push medications is a handy way um, to administer it, there's definitely risk in terms of the uh, preparation, the measurement, uh, certainly the administration. And a number of the studies uh, that relate to injectable medication errors really bear this out. There's way more harm associated with medications when they're given via injection than non-injectable medications. Uh, for example, here, a systematic review and a meta-analysis of nine published studies showed 73% probability of making at least one clinical error with a dose of IV medication or an IV in Fusion. And then in Westbrook's uh, study, looking at errors in the administration of IV medications in hospitals, at least a quarter of the errors were likely going to result in permanent harm. So very, very compelling information as to its importance. Um, looking at a study, some of the early researchers in nursing, Taxis and Barber are UK researchers. Uh, they did a study on 10 wards in the United Kingdom, uh, and then they found that IV administration errors occurred in about 42% of the doses observed. So that would get your attention, I'm sure. The same research team did a follow-up study, and as they drilled this down a little bit more, they found that errors during IV uh, administration occurred frequently during bolus administration. 73%. I mean, it's just, a, it's hard to even hear these numbers. Uh, and then the most common uh, reason was administration uh, too quickly. Many of these medications were even given in less than half of the time that they should have been given. You know, you think about uh, a lot of IV push medications may be administered over two to five minutes. And so um, these medications might have been in one to two minutes. So very um, concerning. 
uh, certainly as we looked within the limited published literature, it did seem to be bearing out that giving IV medications too fast is the most common type of IV drug error. In fact, anywhere from 43 to 69% um, showed that these uh, doses that were pushed too quickly had the majority of them were clinically significant in terms of their issues that they present to the patient. Uh, wide for, uh, variability in the rate of administration. And certainly the individual drug characteristics combined with giving these medications too quickly um, resulted in patients uh, receiving uh, phlebitis, um, obviously could be discomfort and, and other complications. So as an example, I think this is really a, a, just a right on topic uh, error that um, came to us. It was a patient that was coming in in trouble into the emergency department. The physician just uh, prescribed 20 milligrams of labetalol IV. So the nurse went to quickly get the medication, but the patient was moving, uh, was being uh, transferred to uh, radiology. So the nurse is catching up with the patient in the hallway, and she literally pushes this right into the patient, and the patient immediately arrested. Uh, they came to look into this even further in their organization. They found two other cases of where this uh, pushing of labetalol was likely related to bad outcomes for their patients. So certainly these things may be under the radar a bit um, in our organizations. Another risk that we see around IV uh, push medications is the use of this term bolus. What it's meant to describe is a small amount of IV medication over a short time, striving to get a response or a loading dose. But it can be misunderstood and, in fact, has been um, to mean very quickly IV push as opposed to giving it over a short interval. So think about how we communicate some of these orders. I want to switch now to talking about uh, an error type that often we don't consider, and this is uh, related to the dead volume in IV tubing. So we had a patient uh, that was coming out of the operating room into the PACU. The patient was in pain. The PACU nurse was going to get pain medication in terms of hydromorphone. When the nurse is going to administer the medication, uh, finds out that the tubing is clamped, the nurse opens uh, the line flushes it, administers the hydromorphone. Two minutes later, this patient's in respiratory arrest. So come to find out in terms of their review of the case that likely what happened was that prior to leaving uh, the OR, the patient had received uh, rocuronium, and it was still in the tubing. So when the flush and the hydromorphone pushed uh, into the line, it pushed the rocuronium in as a bolus. And, and so when we recognize these tubing lengths, uh, normal tubing is about 60 inches and can hold about 10 milliliters. But anesthesia tubing is certainly much more long, uh, it's 100 inches and can contain 20 milliliters. So you can imagine if you're pushing something that's only a milliliter or two milliliters in an anesthesia tubing, this could be way up the line, may not even be getting to the patient. Flushing is one of those areas that we still have not really gotten our arms totally around uh, how we want to do this. And uh, let me share with you some implications of this. So this dead volume, which is that uh, space in the tubing between the port where I'm going to give the medication and the actual bloodstream, uh, can result in unrecognized and really uh, harmful reservoirs of medications. And in this past era that we're talking about, uh, the dead volume was that space. That volume was containing more than one medication, the two, the, two, the hydromorphone and, and the uh, rocuronium. So when we flush the line or push an IV medication, we may cause too rapid administration of the medication in the tubing. And we may not even consider the impact of the running IV. Okay. So when we give a medication IV push, we need to give the flush at the same rate that we give the medication. So if we have a running IV that's going in very quickly, we may be administering that push medication quicker than we intend to. So we recognize that our researchers have observed uh, practitioners and that the um, suggested do uh, dead volume is, is overlooked by 85 to 100% of nurses. That's pretty compelling. It's just not something that's factored in. And in another study, um, they found that 95% we're flushing in medications too quickly. And again, similarly, probably in half the time that they should be. So work to be done here for sure. 
And when we think about giving IV push medications, I, I mentioned that these are often prescribed to be given over two to five minutes. But when you're at the bedside and you're going to push a medication, as one of probably many that you need to administer to your patient, two to five minutes is a long time. And in our work, you know, Sue and I often, you know, observing practice, we may see nurses giving these push medications, but not having easy access to a clock or a watch. And so the the computer may be mounted on the front or the back wall, so I can't really see the digital clock there. So I, it, it makes us wonder just how well we're giving these medications uh, over the time that they're supposed to be. So, so having uh, ready uh, access to a clock is going to improve practice. And when we choose to use uh, tubing and ports that are much closer to the bloodstream, we're going to get this medication in uh, much more likely in the way it's intended. There's other factors that we found out from those various sources I mentioned that are increasing the risk of error with IV push. Um, if we have to use part of a vial or an ampule or reverse, if we have to use multiple, um, more likely that we might have error um, as part of that. Uh, manipulation. Um, when we need to prepare medications, such as if we have to uh, take it from a vial and pull it into a syringe and measure it, uh, certainly if we've got to do syringe to syringe transfer or multiple dilution, uh, we're likely to be at greater risk for an error in those situation. Uh, it wasn't intuitive to me as I was looking through some of this material in the past, but reconstitution is also um, a situation where we do see more error, and, and I have some information in a subsequent slide, and, and dilution of concentrated injectables. So lots of ways um, that we bring the risk of error into situations. Of all the things that I'll be telling you this morning, this is one of the most important to recognize. One of the biggest risks that we have found related to IV push medications is unnecessary or improper dilution. So dilution in the patient units um, can really lead to unlabeled, mislabeled syringes, uh, contamination as we're preparing the dose, um, and maybe dosing error. Maybe I don't transfer all the dose. So in a 2014 survey that ISP did on dilution practices in adults, we were astounded. We got almost 1,800 uh, responses to this survey. And at the time, we found that 83% of those responding said they further dilute IV push medications. And that would be sometimes, often, and always. And you can see in the sub-bullets the packaging types that were involved in dilution. 77%, sometimes, often, always, were diluting single-dose vials and ampules. Even manufacturer uh, prefilled syringes and pharmacy-prepared syringes were being diluted to a significant degree. And so in 2018, uh, this summer, we put out that uh, survey, again, touching base on some of these practices. And we we did have a good response. We had about a 1,000 uh, that responded, uh, mainly nurses, but also um, some other practitioner types. And the results of that survey show that 84% further dilute IV push medications, again, sometimes, often, always, but a little less frequently. For instance, 59% were diluting single dose vials and ampules compared to 77% in the 2014 study. In uh, both surveys, uh, the most common medications involved, as you can see, were opioids, anti-anxiety, antipsychotic medications. And although further dilution is often uh, not necessary, um, nurses are doing it guided by a desire to administer the drug slowly. You can see 94% answered that was a main reason for doing it. In addition, they're trying to provide uh, patient comfort. Um, a lot of times patients may complain uh, about discomfort during the uh, injection of an IV push medication. Um, another reason, reducing the risk of extravasation. And we do hear uh, a bit as well about the trying to have a better control of giving a small dose. So I'm going to dilute it and then I can see what uh, the volume I'm uh, trying to deliver. Uh, we also have a, a number of respondents that were telling us that they uh, were unnecessary, well, in, in our mind, unnecessarily diluting medications that needed to go into a central line. So the reason they're, they're learning this is uh, central lines, uh, you want to avoid unnecessary high pressure uh, with the use of a small syringe. So 
nurses are taught to use a 10 ml syringe size to flush the line. But there's a mistaken notion that I always have to use a 10 ml size or a, a, a smaller syringe with a 10 ml size uh, diameter uh, to avoid causing a rupture uh, of the catheter. But really, uh, this is something that is not well recognized and it's not necessary. So we had nurses taking commercially prepared syringes, removing the medication from these wonderful syringes that are labeled and have a barcode, and then they're putting it into a 10 ml syringe to, to administer it, thinking that they were doing the right thing. And, and for those who dilute uh, medications in our 2014 survey, um, we asked them, you know, do they have a standard way about uh, doing this work? You know, did they use a standard amount of diluent, at least by drug, and uh, we, we found out that that was still quite variable even for per drug. And then how, how did they do it? Like what was their method? And most of them really had quite unique, like personal formulas. Um, some of it had to do with if I need to administer the dose over three minutes, it's going to be better for me if I can maybe dilute it back to three mils and I'll give a mil per minute. There would be some relationship to the volume and then the time I'm going to push it over. Um, and it could be different if it was peripheral versus a central line. Uh, it was interesting that we didn't have any respondents tell us that their method was intended to get them to a standard concentration. That was just not at all part of that equation. And then only 43% reported that they actually had some references to guide this work uh, of how to dilute properly. So in our 2018 survey, uh, when dilution occurs, most practitioners, 81%, are using flush syringes, okay, commercially available flush syringes for, for drug dilution. You can see here that more than half reported that they were doing this 50% of the time and 19% said they always are going to uh, use a flush syringe uh, as part of this dilution process. Now, in our 2014 survey, uh, about 54% of practitioners said that they were using the commercially available saline syringes uh, for dilution. So definitely a big jump uh, forward there. And uh, this may be related to <clears throat> less availability of uh, normal saline vials on clinical units. Uh, there's a couple ways this is a variable practice uh, that this may be getting done. Um, we could have the flush syringe, and I'm going to push out the volume of drug, uh, and then I'm going to um, draw that drug right in there into that syringe. Um, I may take my drug and draw it up in a syringe, and then I'll add it to the flush syringe uh, that's been emptied of the volume that that dose is going to be. Uh, and then I could also, uh, and so in those two cases, we have drug in the flush syringe. Okay, so we have the risk now that we have a mislabeled syringe. And now a third way is I could take the drug in a syringe and then use the flush syringe sort of as a, a vial, and I'm going to draw into the drug some of the saline. Sadly enough, in most of these cases, the syringe is not relabeled or labeled. So that's very concerning, and we can get into trouble um, for oh, – so let's talk about reconstitution. Um, we also recognize that few medications do really require reconstitution in our work, but, but they are um, out there. And we do uh, surprisingly uh, to, you know, in our way of thinking, there's a lot of risk. Uh, some of the studies between 11 and 49% uh, talk about IV medications that are being diluted with the wrong diluent. So it probably just not even recognizing um, that particular risk. Uh, there's also uh, published errors that ISMP has put out when we're just giving the diluent if it's labeled with the, dr the product name. Um, and oftentimes where these reconstituted medications are drawn back into the syringe containing the diluent. And again, we may be at risk of having mislabeled syringes. So a number of uh, these studies uh, are out there, but we really don't have pay, uh, really great ideas as to what is causing uh, some of these errors. Uh, a few of the studies, like the Taxis and Barber studies, um, did cite some of the latent failures being inadequate training and competency, and as well having limited space or lack of dedicated space for the preparation um, of these IV push doses. 
we certainly have seen in a, in a number of the studies that there's variability. Um, I think we're, you know, Stephen, now even just preparing uh, doses that are diluted, there's lots of ways that happens. And probably one of the biggest aspects is that there's lack of resources. And so I'm learning this on the job. So the way my colleagues do it, um, this is probably sort of a passing down of maybe some at-risk behaviors. And, and that's how I've learned uh, and been uh, exposed to doing some of these practices. So we, uh, back in 2010, I mentioned there was a, a survey that we did uh, looking at the impact of the economic uh, crisis on medication uh, safety practices. And in that survey, uh, a quarter of the nurses were telling us that they were mixing at that time more medications than they had before, even despite the fact that the Joint Commission has a standard to dispense in the most ready to use form. Uh, we think that some of that is also impacted by highly decentralized uh, drug distribution models where many, if not most of the medications on the unit are in automated dispensing cabinets. So then I don't necessarily always have the patient specific dose. So there's some degree of manipulation. So we looked at this again in the uh, summer survey, uh, the 2018 survey, and we had uh, 75% of the nurses were telling us that they did not get uh, commercially uh, prepared or pharmacy prepared um, syringes. Uh, and so then they would then be needing to prepare them themselves. And this may also tie into uh, some of the drug shortage implications, we should think. Also want to touch on uh, other risks that we've certainly uh, heard about published related to uh, misuse of uh, vials, syringes, and needles. Uh, Premier's study in 2010, uh, they had over 5,000 nurses respond, and this had to do with uh, looking at some of these practices with reuse. So 6% of the respondents said they sometimes or always use a single dose or a single use vial for multiple patients. So it's sort of frightening to even, you know, see this as 6%. Uh, 15% sometimes are always are using the same syringe to re-enter a multiple dose vial numerous times. And then 7% of those uh, were saving the vials and they use them on other patients. So right, you're feeling afraid. Uh, 9% sometimes or always could use a common bag or a bottle of IV solution as a source. For, for flushes. We've definitely seen that in our work and people sometimes feel like they're in a safe place if they just have it for their patient. I think that's okay. CDC did a follow-up uh, survey in 2017. Uh, this was uh, sent out to physicians and nurses who uh, administer IV um, push medications. They had about 700 respondents. Uh, 12% of physicians, 3% of nurses um, were reusing syringes for more than one patient. So you, would, you wouldn't even think that you would hear this in 20, 2017, right? Almost 5% of physicians indicated um, that this practice usually or always occurred in their workplace. So it, it's hard to imagine. We know that um, the CDC has had their campaign, the one needle, one syringe, only one time. So they did that survey last year thinking that they really want to get a handle on hopefully there's been a very positive impact. And of course there has been, but there's still, we recognize, you know, somewhat of uh, a lack of awareness yet. Um, and there's mistaken beliefs that I can reuse a single dose vial um, depending on its size. So if it's a bigger vial, it's probably okay. I'm probably safer. I can use this more than one time. Um, Re-entry into a multiple dose vial um, it shouldn't be a problem uh, because there's bacteriostatic um, agents or preservatives. Not recognizing uh, that it's not going to kill all bacterial uh, at bacteria and it certainly doesn't have any um, antifungal or antiviral capabilities. Um, I'm in a safer place uh, if I'm using a common bag, uh, if we discard it after 24 hours. And we still, although not as frequently as we have in the past, do uh, occasionally find that. And then changing the needle. I'm, I'm going to be fine. I can still use the same syringe and same vial. I'll just change the needle. And this is not just nurses who think this. Um, for instance, we had a situation where anesthesiologists were reusing syringes. I believe it was propofol. Uh, they just changed the needle and they ended up having uh, 63,000 patients exposed and over 200 got effect, infected. And, and we still occasionally hear of these, but we've had a lot of patients um, in the last probably number of years that have been exposed and, and have gotten um, a bloodborne uh, pathogen. 
Um, s- similarly, in terms of like these issues, when we did our 20, um, I believe it was 2011 survey, we were looking to find out if nurses understood and what the impact was on their practice about the overfill in carp reject pre-filled syringes. And what we uh, came to find out, although we'd seen it like in practice and we we're on site as hospitals, we were talking about it that we see nurses taking off the needleless adapter and then they're using the uh, pre-filled cartridge as almost like a vial to pull off a dose, and they may use it for more than one time. Um, so certainly that was concerning to us. So nurses weren't worried about the overfill because they were using the cartridges differently than intended. Uh, we did have about 12% of nurses that were responding to the same survey. They were concerned uh, about some of these risks. So that was uh, interesting um, to, to get that feedback. That, you know, some of these folks were recognized. The risk of contamination when I'm entering into this cartridge is not intended for this purpose. And uh, using um, single doses uh, cartridges as multi-doses. Uh, certainly there was those uh, risks that I'm going to have a mislabeled or an unlabeled syringe as a result. Um, the dosing, I could lose some of this. I could be giving it an accurate volume when I'm transferring it. It's really sad to think that when we have these wonderful syringes syringes that um, are labeled and have a barcode, that now we're taking them out of that setting and we're putting it into a syringe that's probably not going to be labeled and also doesn't have a barcode. Uh, so certainly there's also some risks related to diversion um, and documenting as wasted. Uh, some of the variety of reasons that nurses were telling us they weren't using them as designed was, again, this whole either preference or need to dilute a medication before injection. That was number one. Coming in right in second, and it was, you know, still significant, was not having the correct syringe holder. So that was uh, news that we were trying to get out there to make sure that these kind of holders were available. And you can see there's a variety of other reasons. That's how I learned to do it. Um, I might not be able to read the increments, you know, within the the uh, holder very well. So a a bunch of reasons, but the most frequent was about dilution. So talking further about this labeling of nurse prepared syringes, back in the uh, American Nurses Association survey in uh, 07, um, we really got a little bit more of a handle about how often nurses are preparing uh, these uh, injection-based doses. And 44% of the nurses who responded um, were saying that they prepare about five of these syringes a shift. So, boy, you could get really a lot more clarity around the frequency of nurses having syringes and the potential uh, for not being labeled. Um, we also, in our uh, 2018 study, or survey that is, um, asked about labeling, and we did find that only 28% of those responding said that they um, would label it, and it would be only labeled less than 10% of the time. Only 50% reported always labeling their syringes. Uh, some of that practice may be just a matter of taping the vial to the syringe. So we're very concerned. We're not seeing very consistent practices around labeling nurse-prepared syringes. And that can get us into trouble. Here's an example of an error type. It's pretty frightening. Um, in this setting, uh, there was a syringe uh, of vacuronium that was prepared uh, for an ED trauma patient. It, it ended up not being used. It was set down. Unfortunately, it was set down near a container uh, of other flush syringes that I think the nurses had prepared. And this vacuronium inadvertently was used to flush the line of a PD pediatric patient um, who obviously uh, was impacted and stopped breathing. Uh, Fortunately, because of the setting, um, the child was able to be uh, intubated and resuscitated. But again, that that danger from this risky practice um, could have uh, involved a child's death. So uh, the reasons why syringes are not labeled in our current uh, survey this year Nurses feel like they're in a safe place if it's only uh, one medication that's being prepared or, or just one syringe. So you can see the percents there. You know, half of them thought, you know, I'm in a pretty safe place, 45 to 51 percent. What was also interesting and concerning was that nurses sometimes felt very able to rely on some differences between a couple unlabeled syringes. So I might uh, be able to say, okay, well, this one's three mils, so it's this drug, and this one's only one mil, so I'll remember it's this drug. 
and or I'm, I, this one's in a 3ml syringe and this one's in a 5ml syringe. So I'll remember what they are. So we're not in a safe place when, when we're doing that. And it's 2018 and, and we're, we're sad, Sue and I, to as nurses to see that those risks are not appreciated. That's some pretty interesting stuff from the Institute for Safe Medicine Practices. Uh, these are the experts in the field. Uh, and their recommendations based on all those problems they identified are, you know, some of them are practical for in-hospital only. Uh, for example, this one, to whatever extent possible, provide IV push medications in ready-to-administer form. We can't always do that on the ambulance, but in the hospital, you have an entire pharmacy department that can prepare those things for you. They do uh, also recommend using only commercially available pre-filled syringes for flushes, not drawing up your own. Uh, we do that in the ambulance, of course, but when you run out, uh, it's common practice for us to throw a needle on a syringe and start drawing up saline out of bags. That's not considered a safe medication practice. The aseptic techniques that we learned in IV tech and paramedic school that frequently get skipped because we're in a rush and we just put the IV in, and so we assume that the hub is still clean, you really do need to make a habit of cleaning the ports, especially in a critical care service where we pick up patients who have lines that are uh, put in place prior to our arrival. Those ports are not clean. You have to use aseptic techniques. Then, of course, using filter needles when you draw from amp ampules, we know that, and that is a common practice for us. We don't have a problem there. Here's one that really threw me for a loop. Only dilute medications when it's recommended. It's been a common practice for me. I was taught to do this by some of the uh, old school dinosaurs, to draw up medications into a saline flush so that it's more dilute, more gentle on the system, easier to administer slowly, not a safe practice. Not only because we're not labeling the syringes, and you might put it down and forget which syringe is which, but manufactured saline flushes are unidirectional. They are only meant for that plunger to go in one direction only, and they are not tested, and they are not approved for you to pull that plunger back in order to draw medication up out of a vial. So you cannot use those syringes to draw things up because they are not considered sterile, they haven't been tested, and they're not approved for that kind of use. And then this is something that we don't do in the ambulance, but uh, some nursing units would hang a, a liter saline bag, and that would be the bag that they would use to draw up all their saline for all their flushes for multiple patients all day long. And uh, there's kind of a standard uh, custom of making it a 24-hour rule. You put the date and time on the bag, and you let it hang for 24 hours, and everybody can use that bag for the next 24 hours. Not a safe practice. So how many of these things have you violated and would you think differently about it knowing that it's a safety risk and maybe not this time, maybe not the next time, but if you do this long enough and with enough patience, you're going to run into a problem sometime and you might as well develop the right habits and the right muscle memory to get this done safely. That is a lot of really good information from the Institute for Safe Medication Practices. Let's boil it down to what's relevant to us on the ambulance, because some of it is only interesting and a learning experience, but it's not quite what happens in the back of the ambulance. So let's boil it down and make it practical for us. Let's be honest. Most of the time we give a medication, we want to give Zofran, we draw up the Zofran, we give it, and we're done. It's a very simple process, not a lot of chance for a medication error to occur. But what we want to do is develop the muscle memory and the habits that are going to avoid errors when things start to get more complicated. As Z-Dog in his video pointed out, hospitals have lots of process and systems that they can tweak in order to help us avoid medication errors and none of those things exist in the ambulance. We're on our own. So the only thing we can do is develop the right habits from the beginning. So what should those habits be? Medications that are drawn up and administered should be done so only in a syringe that's designed for that purpose. Don't use the pre-filled saline flushes to draw up medications. They are not designed to be sterile 
bidirectionally. It's a unidirectional syringe. If you're giving multiple medications, label the syringes so it's not possible to mistake one for the other. And don't rely on your memory to protect you. Don't use the system, okay, I'm going to put this drug in the 3cc syringe, I'm going to put that drug in the 10cc syringe, and I'll just remember. Because when the stuff hits the fan, there's a good chance you're going to forget. And you want to develop the habits now that are going to avoid the chance of a mistake later. One last thing that was in the ISMP video that I edited out for length, but I thought was relevant because we're a critical care service, and I've actually heard people training on this topic in our ambulances, and that is the size of a syringe that's necessary to access a central line. The rule is you for a saline flush that you are checking patency on the central line, has to be 10 cc or larger so you don't over pressurize putting too much pressure in and breaking something uh, by pushing in fluid too quickly that does not apply to giving medication you can give medication in any size syringe in a central line according to ismp the reason why this is an important safety thing is because if you have a pre-filled medication syringe that's smaller than 10 cc's, there's no reason to transfer it to a larger syringe in order to obey a rule that doesn't exist. The rule is when you're flushing to check patency, 10 cc or larger, otherwise use any size syringe you want on a central line. All right, so that's really kind of the learning things that I got from this. I hope you learned something too. I know I'm gonna change my practices as a result of my research I did here. I thank you for joining us, and I will see you the next time.